Well, this is a kind of a introduction slash recap video. It's, um, I didn't film a lot before I went to Minnesota for the Chromeversary. Um, because, I mean, do you really want to watch me be frustrated in an airport? I guess, um, if you do, let me know. But I really hate flying. And it's not even like the flying that bothers me. Like, you know, I'm fine with that. It's the uh, airport is what really bothers me. And, and the tube of people that bother me. Um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's an awful thing. But so we did that. Um, so I kind of decided last minute that I was going to go because my job's still pretty mad at me for going to the whole Jamie thing. Uh, helping Jamie, you know, before he died. So their punishment was to take away all my vacation time. So I had just enough to be able to fly out there so I couldn't bring Oddball with me. But I decided what the hell, let's do it. And um, they didn't fire me before. I guess uh, let's keep pushing the envelope. I mean, what the hell, right? And um, just makes me laugh. Think about... Uh, going to that job every day, and uh, anyway, so I bought the tickets, and we decided to uh, fly out there, I was just going to do the whole thing, and um, one of the things I needed to do, though, while I was out there, was Weird Al has a song called The Biggest Ball of Twine in Minnesota. So I looked it up, and it was like 70 miles away from Belle Plaine, so, you know, for Darwin. And uh, so I decided to uh, make a pilgrimage, make this a double event situation. And we'll go to Darwin and check out the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. So, but anywho's, so I decided what the hell, let's friggin' do it. And I got a ticket. Nothing but delays. Chicago International Airport's a piece of shit still. And nothing but delays there. And I didn't get to the hotel till like 1.30 in the morning. Something like that. Maybe it was 2. And so I was just like, bam. Just tired. And uh, the guy at the front desk, I felt bad wanking him up. But everyone there was very nice. And uh, I actually... Really liked the hotel. It was American Inn or something like that. It's the hotel. Kind of down the street from the factory. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was really cool. And they, were, they had a bunch of stuff planned for the Chromeversary. And I wanted to meet some people. And I figured for the Chromeversary, there'd be some people, I, you know, a lot more people. And I was right, you know. So, it's not like I was right. Obviously, it was right. You know, I'm going to just say, obviously, that was correct. That was a correct way of thinking. It's not like I willed it to happen, you know. Whatever. So, yeah, I went out there and uh, um, woke up and just started meeting everybody. And Joe Tucson came out there. Uh, Joni. Joe and Joni are uh, really awesome people. I met some really cool people. Um, I'm really sorry if I'm missing anybody's names because I'm really bad with names. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good face person, you know, but, um, Steve and Earl talked with them a bunch and I had a great time talking to them. They're, they're great people. There was one bike that Jamie didn't get to work on and it was completely stripped to pieces. And, uh, the guy came to pick up the bike in the pieces and I and I helped him load that on and he was there I got to say hi to him again and um, met uh, the guys over at Fago um, I was really happy to meet them because they seem to really be picking up the torch and uh, kind of picking up where Jamie left off and doing their own thing you know it's not just a, a Jamie copycat facility you know, they're actually moving forward, and I was really happy to see that. 
and I got a keychain from him. I should have brought it out here, but it's already on a key ring. And uh, yeah, we got to meet, you yeah, know, I got to meet, um, damn, what was his name? He introduced himself to me and said, hi, my name is, and then he said, I put the first $20 down for the membership. That guy. Um, got to meet him. He was he was a funny guy full of stories, smoked cigars constantly. You know who I'm talking about. Um, got to meet Grandpa Grumpy Pants, uh, Bruce. Um, really cool to meet Bruce. Um, obviously, you know, um, Mike Seastrom, Mike uh, Locklear. Um, I kind of feel like uh, I'm starting to know those two guys pretty good. And, um, yeah. So we just kind of, and, and a bunch of other people, I'm sure they'll come out. The names will come out. But, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And we went, um, the first day they went on a ride. And uh, I didn't have my bike, and I wasn't looking to borrow anybody's or anything. So I was like, you guys go on your ride. I'm going to head out to the biggest ball twine in Minnesota. And uh, I'm going to keep calling it that because that is what it is. It's not the biggest twine ball in the world. It's not the biggest twine ball in the U.S. It's the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. And uh, it's a really good song. Please go check it out. Um, listen to the whole album. I think it's the UHF album even. And I think the ball of twine was in uh, National Lampoon's Vacation too, if I... If I remember right, uh, uh, yeah, the first vacation. And um, got distracted by the twine ball. Oh, yeah, we're going to go out. So everybody went on that first ride. Um, I didn't get up early enough to help set up anything because I was tired. I slept until like 8, 9, whatever. Um, barely made it in time. It was 8 because the, the breakfast ended at 9. I barely got in there to get coffee every morning. But uh, got me so, myself a little Jeep Gladiator rental and uh, drove it out to Darwin. And right when I got to Darwin, there was this global meltdown of Microsoft. Okay. So as soon as I got there, no, you couldn't pay cash for anything, right? Or you had to pay cash for anything. The card wouldn't work because everybody's systems were shut down. So I had to go to this gas station because I was going to buy one of everything at the gift store. And I even called in to make sure somebody was there. And I'm not leaving without stuff. So, I, you know, the town's, town's real cool. Um, it's really fun to see it, a, a town kind of built around of a weird attraction like that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a silly side quest, but I really liked it. And um, went and got some money and did the whole twine ball thing. And, um, it smells exactly how you think it would. It smells like an old barn full of hay bale twine. Um, a little moist. Definitely was uh, a little wet in there. And because uh, they just got all the floods, the dam just broke. Minnesota was a little bit of a mess, but they didn't let that stop them. Uh, everything there was just as open, just as friendly. I was having, uh, I had no problems. Um, we can't blame Minnesota for the meltdown thing, but um, so I went to the gas station, uh, got the thing, and talked to the lady behind the counter a bunch. And I did. I got uh, I got a T-shirt. I got the koozie. I got uh, a hat. I got frisbees. I got just all kinds, just whatever they would sell me. I think I spent like seventy six dollars or eighty bucks. Oh, an oven mitt, you know, stickers and shit. And because uh, it made me laugh a lot.
So while I'm out here on this ride, I had to stop, take my pilgrimage to the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. It's, uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. Not in the world, just in Minnesota. But as a Weird Al fan, who could pass up the opportunity, right? Yeah, so twine ball or bust, y'all. I didn't open a beer. Um, not my jam, but I got something else I'll show you guys later. Instead of a beer. Minnesota style. But yeah, twine ball. So then, you know, on, on my way back, and it's all that um, just straight checkerboard farmland, right? But I get back, and just about when the other ride's coming in, so they, you know, so this is the, this is my favorite part. I love just sitting there and listening to the stories, because I'm, you know, I'm 20 years tardy to the party here. I got a lot to catch up on, and so... You know, hanging out with Joe and Joni, um, obviously, are is always a highlight. Oh, I met uh, Ray and his wife. Um, they call him uh, X-Ray. Um, uh, got to hang out with him a bunch, and uh, he's from Idaho. Good guy. Um, uh, got more Ray stories coming. But so we uh, just hung out that first night, talked, you know, I let everybody kind of just tell stories and um, see some old faces and see a lot of new faces. I've met a lot of people. Um, Seastrom, uh, the, the whole crew was there. Got my T-shirts uh, from you know the parts store and uh, just kind of partied that night. Drank a little bit. I found some uh, sodas at that gas station that were a little uh, funny, if you know what I'm saying. So uh, thanks, Minnesota, for having the sodas available. Um, not, a, not a big drinker. I'll have a couple beers. But uh, when I'm out, you know, on a holiday like this, I'll drink a little more. But yeah, so you know, just partied till we wanted to sleep. The mosquitoes were out. But uh, went, that didn't stop anybody. And, uh, yeah, so then we just kind of woke up the next day. Oh, that night we went to dinner and, um, at this Mexican food restaurant and that soda I had was really starting to kick in. So I went and uh, asked Joe and Joni if they were driving over, if I could ride with them. Cause, uh, I could barely walk in a straight line. I didn't think I was going to be able to drive it, obviously. So we rode over, or drove over there, and um, I was hanging out with um, Shannon and his wife, um, and got to know them really well too. They were really very cool people. They, they remind me a lot of my family, actually. And uh, so as soon as I met them, I was like, "These, you know, I know these people." And so, um, great food at this little Mexican joint. Um, kind of overwhelmed them, but, you know, we had a good time and, uh, did the whole, did the whole thing. But the next day, um, Locklear, uh, Mike Locklear had a bike for me to borrow and I really appreciate it. I'm not a big fan of borrowing other people's bikes cause, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot of like stress on me. Um, cause I don't want to screw anything up. But, uh, so, uh, thanks to Mike for loaning me the Red and Oyster, and, uh, we went on a ride, Shannon was the leader for that one, and went and saw a couple little towns there, and then the last little town, um, I was getting kind of tired, and I just kind of wanted to head back, and I was sitting on a bench, uh, with X-Ray, and just, just chatting, you know, I just met the guy, so, but I was like, ah, screw it, let's, you know. 
I didn't want to go into the VFW and drink. I, I just wanted, kind of wanted to go and get on the road. And you know how you get antsy. So sitting there talking to Ray and um, Steve and Earl decided they were going to take off and head back to the hotel. And then uh, Ray was going to join them. And I was like, yeah, what the hell? Let's, let's hang out with these guys. And we rode all the way back there. And we get back to the hotel. And I went and filled up you know, Locklear's bike again for him and came back and Ray came up and was like, oh shit, did you see my wallet? I was like, no, um, he lost his wallet. It wasn't in his bag. It wasn't anywhere. And, you know, did we see it on the bench? And I rode behind him the whole time. I was in the rear and I didn't see anything fall out. So I was like, oh shit. Well, then they called the restaurant. They didn't see anything. And I was like, well, let's jump in the truck and, uh, you know, I'll drive out there. And that way we can, you know, cause it looked like it was going to rain. And so we jumped in the truck and did the whole ride again, basically, and uh, stopped everywhere we could, didn't see as well. And I felt really bad because that sucks, you know. And he had his, you know, concealed permit in there. He had his all his uh, military IDs and, you know, uh, driver's license, cash. I mean, you, you know what I mean. You know what it means to lose a wallet. That sucks, you know. So I, I felt bad, and I, I truly did feel bad. I was like, fuck, and like on day two. And uh, so we get back, and um, we're going to go, you know, to the restaurant. And, you know, I offered to, you know, pay him, but, you know, his wife still had, you know, his, her side of everything. But I was like, okay, whatever. And But, you know, as long as you're cool, and I felt bad. And we get back to the restaurant, and uh, he comes in a little bit later. And his wallet had stuck to the side of the inside of the saddlebag there. And he missed it. So, he, you know, he felt bad. But, you know, I, I had a great time. So we got to hang out with Ray a bunch. And uh, in, in this rental car that had prepaid gas. And I was like, he was like, uh, he wanted to pay for gas. And I was like, why? I mean, we already prepaid the gas. Let's just go. So that that was a great time. I, I you know... I hope it comes across in the channel that I'm always up for adventure. So when people, you know, we, we don't ever need to apologize for something like that because that's a lot of fun. I mean, I got to hang out with X-Ray, got to hear some cool stories, talk about Idaho, get to see somewhere in Minnesota, drive this weird Jeep. People kept leaving ducks on my door. And, uh, you know, it was a great time. So no apologizing, Ray. It was a great time. And, uh, yeah, so we had a great time there, and, um, yeah, the restaurant we ate was right there in the, the parking lot. Good restaurant, good breakfast. Um, Minnesota was great. Just, you know, hung out. Next day we hung out. Oh, you know, we did do the next day. Um, since some of the guys are kind of local, I'm sure I'm not getting skeeters. Um, they knew somebody there in Belle Plaine who had a toy museum, a private museum. It's uh, his own private collection. And he does little tours here and there, you know, but you kind of got to, you got to kind of know him, you know. And so we went to go tour this toy museum and um, the guy who owned it, um, again, bad with names, was 103 years old, I think, somewhere right around there. And he loves to give tours. And this whole toy fact, or this toy museum he had, he loved tractor and truck toys. And it was three different levels of just every toy you could possibly imagine. It was crazy. And he had a little, right up in the beginning, you know, a little uh, sitting area where he, he could still sit and drink beer. And he lived in a kind of like a... Uh, home now but he could um he get, he only gets to get out there about a couple of days a week now but because i'm a crazy person the first thing i noticed was he had a hover round and i'm not sure i've ever seen a hover round in the wild <laughs> i don't know if you've ever seen a hover round before but that damn commercial played constantly and it was this, um, when I was a kid, and it was these two old ladies that were in the Grand Canyon, and this voice was like, hey, Margaret, and whatever, 
how did how did you get to the Grand Canyon? And they then they like yodel. They're like hover around, and it just kind of echoes to the Grand Grand Canyon. But as a kid, I ran around screaming hover around, and um, so I saw the hover around, and it still had like the '90s graphics on it and shit. It was all pink and teal, and I. <laughs> This the whole time. I know I'm supposed to be doing this toy thing, but and I didn't ask him about it, obviously. But the whole time, I just wanted to be like, mm, "But tell me about this hover round, because I've heard so much about it." Yeah. So, um, <laughs> besides the hover round, right? The um, uh, and I didn't know how many pictures or videos we were allowed to take. I didn't want to be a jerk, so you know, I took. Yeah, I took a bunch, but I didn't go overboard and even had a section of dolls. And um and you could you could see that he was like, Well, let's also start collecting dolls so for the girls to have something too. Like you could see the thought process of the doll room. And um he had um, you know, model he had one room where it was all the decades of farming set up. And so he had like a bunch of different ranches and all the toys and barns and things that would correspond. So it looked like a working farm, you know, through the decades. And uh, so that, that was really cool, too. And you know, I, I, I found uh, I couldn't I couldn't find a Ferguson because um, that's uh, that's something special to, to our hearts right now. But I did find, you know, we did find a bunch of cool tractors. He had a bunch of uh because they were friends with the Hanolins, so they've got a bunch of the the toys that were going to come out that you know did or didn't come out, and uh, they even had a section where it was two rooms dedicated to the um, to make it look like the original house that his family immigrated from Germany looked like, and had all the family stuff in there, and he had you know a fire engine in there, a couple Model Ts. Um, yeah, it was really cool. And so I was glad we did that. Um, and then, uh, but that day, just more, we had, um, they had a bit of a swap meet there where you could get um, some of the new parts that uh, the Excelsior Henderson's coming out with, with the, the new saddlebags, things like that. Um, people bringing down old T-shirts. Um, I got this sign. It's about seven foot tall banner and that was a little piece of jamie's um they they also did uh they had they brought down some of jamie's um memorabilia and stuff to sell so the money could go to um uh, marty and i think we we sold i think we made like thirteen fourteen hundred dollars for marty which is really cool and um so um, and, and Frank out of Chicago, he did a, um, he did some biker games that actually went, you, you could see people were hesitant to do it, but when they started doing it, then they had a lot of fun. And, uh, that just makes me laugh because that, that is this group in a nutshell, uh, from when I, from, from what I've known them for, they're a little reluctant. But once you start going, it's hard to stop them. And uh, so that made me laugh to watch that process unfold. And I uh, uh, spent a lot of time with a guy named Chop. Um, uh, Chop has this laugh. It's this really infectious laugh, and he loves to laugh. So just, you know, you get him going, and then it just keeps going, and then you're laughing, and then everyone's laughing, so... I had a great time with Chop. Uh, shout out to Chop. And um, um, there was, uh, um, give me a second, the Cools. Hey, um, Keith and Tammy, they had their wedding. And uh, they came out when I was, you know, helping wrap up uh, with Jamie there. They came out to help too, and they were they were a, a big help, and we really got to you know hang out and know each other pretty well. So I was really happy to be able to attend their wedding, and uh, so that was a lot of fun too. And um, yeah, it was just kind of like 
It's just kind of like, um, again, you know, I, I still get new. I'm still new to this whole concept of, you know, doing things in a group. So, and I really like this group because it's about my pace. I've always kind of got along with a little, somewhat of an older crowd. Um, all my friends were always, you know, older, you know, hence Jamie. I just, um, something about it, I could just get along better with the older crowd. Not that I don't get along with young people. I just gravitate towards, maybe, you know what it is? It's just, I think it's because I like to just listen to stories. And, you know, I, I like to just absorb knowledge like that. And. So I really, I really enjoy that. You know, all the, all working on all these motorcycles and working on all these cars. This was all just, you know, gained knowledge through that. Yeah, you know, through l listening to people who have done it before. Um, if I have to invent something, you know, I, I'll give it a go. I like to try. But if someone's already done it, you know, wh why, why reinvent it? And, um, yeah, so just, just that wealth and wealth of knowledge in the group is, is a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And so, um, and I even got to, uh, I met, uh, Dan and I asked Dan about the, uh, the podium and, uh, he was saying that in the factory, um, there was a time capsule. And I, he thinks it's still there. But in the floor, right when you walk in, there was kind of a, a circle situation. And there was two steel doors that uh, housed the uh, time capsule. And they built that podium. He had, they had a guy, a local guy in Belle Plaine build up. And so, again, you know, he was talking about how that guy did all the work and he did a really good job. And it is. It's a real well-built piece of woodwork there. But... He, uh, they made it to the exact dimensions of that metal thing. So it would sit over the time capsule, and when people would come in, they would write um, into the guest book there, right above the time capsule. So I thought that was kind of neat that they had a, um, you know, a time capsule in there, and then an actual record of time on top of it, you know. So that was pretty cool. Um, so learned a lot about there, got to see the outside of the factory, you know, didn't get to go in it or anything, but, um, we got time and, um, yeah, just, and then cause the whole global meltdown thing, you know, my flight got canceled a couple of times and I was like, ah, oh, man, like going back is going to be this nightmare and all this other shit. And so I helped pack up the um help lot you know mike locklear you know get his trailer packed up try to help everyone i can pack up help joe get loaded and uh help people get loaded and strapped down and all this stuff and um that's that's until about you know 11 o'clock at night and i had my flight after all the cancellations ended up being at six in the morning so I figured I had to be there about four because it was such a shit show. And with all this other stuff, it's probably going to be worse, which means I had, to, you know, it takes an hour to get there. So which means I had to get up at, or I had to leave at three. And then it takes me, you know, 30 minutes to, to shit and get ready. So that means two thirty. So I got, you know, a few hours of sleep and then drove to uh, the airport. And when I got to the uh, Minneapolis airport, I walked in there and just people sleeping everywhere. And I was like, oh, God. Oh, God. And I was this close. There was a, um, yeah, I think it was like a 65 or something like that. <clears throat> um, Bridgestone 125 uh, for sale in Bell Plain. It was like 150 bucks. Hasn't ran in 10 years. And I was like, mm, I should just buy that because they're going to cancel all my air, my flights and shit just going to buy that we'll fix it up and hit the road and then everybody you know the airlines are like no no no, we got you we got you and I was like, okay fine you know and then it sold which is fine kind of bummed me out but it's fine 
And um, I was really looking forward to tearing that bike down in the hotel parking lot, putting it back together, and then trying to ride it to San Diego at, you know, 55 miles an hour or whatever. See, it moves backwards. But, uh, um, <clears throat> And I was really hoping to do that so I could call my job and be like, hey, airplanes are all fucked. I'm just going to uh, have to come back, you know, and uh, see if I get fired that way. But alas. So anyway, get to the airport. Smooth as, smooth as glass. The whole fucking thing. I even got back to San Diego half an hour early. Like, whatever. Going there. Complete nightmare. Coming home. Smooth as butter. So, um, yeah, and uh, it's fun to see, too, because these bikes still mean, still mean something to someone out there, you know? And I was really happy to see that there's still people out there that care, and I'm going to do my best, you know, to keep, keep caring. And there's, a, you know, there's actually starting to be more new faces, and, you know, even the, the Fago team up there. They're, you know, they're doing their best, you know, to keep everything. And, you know, he's learning and um, they're, uh, I haven't had any work done by him yet, but a lot of people have, and they've been doing a great job and, you know, a couple bikes. Um, um, I mean, let me think of his name, Tom Schmack. I'm pretty sure I got that right. Um, I was talking with Tom, but on the ride, I was just hearing it sound like popcorn <laughs> popping. And, you know, he pulled up to me and it and then died on him and he restarted it. And uh, he had uh, a little gasket in between his air cleaner um, and throttle body and stuff went out and everything went to, or so, something up there. And, uh, you know, um, the Fago team, you're gonna have to forgive me, okay? I'm sorry. I for Dwayne, thank you. Damn. Brain. But I so Dwayne was able to, you know, was there and fixed it right there on the spot. So um I thought that was really cool. That that's the kind of stuff that, you know, you really you like to see you like to see um a community sticking together and um yeah, we it was a good time, and I learned a lot, and I really do appreciate everybody, and especially, you know, the team for the the, the board of directors, all them for putting this on, getting everything together. Uh, Tammy and Keith, congratulations! Your wedding was awesome, and the food was good. They fed us all. I got to meet your family, which was really cool. Um, Keith's brother is heart of gold amazing person um forgot his name i'm sorry and um but yes yeah, you know thanks to the, the whole the whole seastrom you know put, bringing all the stuff up he brought up oh you know what he did bring up so i did talk to somebody there and it's not chop um but he had another name like that mm, he's part of the road crew uh, well, uh, damn, I'm so bad with names. Anyway, um, sorry, Chuck, maybe. I think it was Chuck. I was talking to him because he had the slim fender like the, the new Deadwood does. And so I asked him about it, and he, he was saying that, because that one's fiberglass, that those fenders... We're part of this was going to be like hey we're coming out you know they would take it around to when they would you know show the bikes off and be like here's some of the other stuff that's coming that you can order as accessories and they made a handful of them and then the mold broke um so that's where this came from and this has the metal bracket underneath but he uh, i was asking him and he was pretty surprised that you know, I, I had one, too, because apparently they were a little hard to come by. Um, 
on this bike here. And I, again, I don't know how many were made. I can't remember, you know, uh, what he said, because I don't think he was quite sure either. But we did, um, but yeah, so then the mold broke. Well, Seastrom has that mold, and I thought that was really cool um, for the slim fender there, because that slim fender does kind of, it adds a real sleek touch to it. And the Deadwood, I, you know, I don't want to touch it because I really like that sleek style of it. I like kind of the stripped down bike thing of it. And I did learn, too, that it's got a 30 tooth sprocket on there as well. Because it feels a little different driving it versus oddball. And uh, so, yeah, I thought that was fun, too. Um, yeah, and we, we, yeah, we just had, uh, yeah, it was a really good time. And I'm glad I did it. <sighs> and I could probably go on forever, but, you know, it's, uh, these stories will roll out as we go. And, um, but I just, you know, I wanted to make a video talking about, you know, the fun I had and everything, because I, it does mean a lot to me to, um, to meet these people. So, um, if nothing else, hopefully they watch this video because, um, everybody I met there, uh, awesome, obviously. And so thanks again, but, um, getting a little antsy because I haven't rode in a minute. And I think I'm going to take that Deadwood on another test drive. So, um, coming up, we got some more stuff with that bike. And um, so stay tuned, because that bike, and it's got an unofficial name so far. Um, so you know how on the Deadwood, the engine, the, the head is silver, the jug is black, right? And somebody who knows nothing about motorcycles and isn't even a car person, someone I work, uh, someone I work with, looked at that and said, "Ah, the engine kind of looks like Tupperware." And in in the in the storage room at work, you may have Tupperware for people to use, and it does. It looks you've got black Tupperware and the gray lids. And it looks exactly like the stack of Tupperware. And so I've been calling it Tupperware, which is not a very cool name. Okay. Um, and I get that. But I like, I like the motorcycles to be named by other people. You know, it's like giving your, yourself your own nickname. You know, you can't do that. Um, you know, unless you're, unless you're really cool um, and you need a rapper name. You know, sometimes you can fabricate that and it'll stick. But normally you need someone else to, to give things nicknames. And so so far, that's the only thing anybody said about it so far is Tupperware. So um, the more I say it, the more it's going to stick. Mm, I don't know. Um, so, so far, the unofficial, unofficial nickname so far is Tupperware for that bike. Um, yeah, let's go get it warmed up because um, we still got to put some more miles on it and uh, diagnose this clutch problem. It's annoying, but we'll get it. Um, yeah, fuck it. I'm done. Peace out, y'all. So I made it last night at like two in the morning got uh, the bell playing in and sweets or whatever it's called but uh, yeah the plane sucked whatever but now we're here and we're hanging out we're gonna have a good time ish can't imagine we'd have a bad time just got done visiting the twine ball. And uh, let's go see what we got over here.
right, here we are at the uh, 25th anniversary rally. Maybe. people's bikes that makes me nervous. Yeah, yeah. Nah, don't crash me. Look at how you did it. Yeah. 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 Is that you? Yep. I heard some coughing and wheezing. <laughs> <laughs> 